Welcome to Product AMA, your daily online Ask Me Anything. We started Product AMA to give those passionate or curious about product management a daily break, something to look forward to. The format is one hour in length, weekdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. The first 30 minutes will always be a guest and a featured topic. The last 30 minutes is devoted to you, the audience, to ask your questions. Before today, you know, our topic is all about engaging your audience in your mobile app. And we have John Coombs from uh, Rover here. He's the CEO and, and co-founder of Rover. And before we get going with the questions, I'll give you a little bit of background on John. So he, he founded Rover some time ago, and it's a platform that supports marketers and brands to create native mobile content without the reliance and ongoing dependency of developers and releases. Clients can create targeted campaigns right in the platform, and they're delivered to the app user through notifications and other means that we'll talk about today. John, thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you guys have, have picked, picked things up in the COVID era. It's all about innovation and adapting to our, our uh, current reality. So good, good for you guys. This is great. Appreciate it, John. Thank you. So we'll, we'll get right into it. So to our first question, we, we wanted to get a sense of, of where Rover fits into this, this landscape of, of mobile mm -hmm. products. We heard from uh, Gabe Smallman from Adept Mobile, and I know that you know Gabe. Gabe was on Product AMA last week. And um, I think you're at least in one app, but maybe maybe other apps with, with Gabe. We just wanted to understand, kind of as as Rover puts itself and positions itself, you know, in the landscape of you know mobile dev agencies and platforms or software or product as a service. We we have all these interchangeable names that we're using today to yeah. describe what digital products actually are. We just want you to spend a little bit of time telling us about the problem that that Rover solves for its clients that maybe some of those agencies or other platforms just haven't been able to do to the same degree? Yeah, yeah, good question. I, I definitely get asked this one a lot, which is, okay, you don't make apps, but you're in apps, you know, where do you start and where does the app developer stop? And I think, you know, just for, for some context, you you introduced it quite well, but really what, what Rover does is, is really two pieces. On, on one hand, we have a bunch of tools that uh, leverage data to determine, you know, who should get uh, a piece of content or a marketing campaign. So this is sort of the contextual piece of Rover. And then the second piece, which you you outlined, is really the ability to update the app uh, without a dependency on developer effort, um, resources, and time. Um, you know, so really what that does is when you look at an app environment, so, you know, you mentioned Adept, um, you've got a roadmap, right? You've got things that you wanna build for your app. And some of those things are core features, core functionality that you wanna invest in. So in the case of a sports app, um, the standings, uh, a feed from the league around scores, um, ticketing, those are long-term, you know, crucial underlying features. But on top of that, you also have a lot of use cases that are really valuable to the fan, valuable to the team or, or the audience that are more uh, ephemeral or short-term in nature. So you can think about marketing initiatives, sponsorship activations, content that's only relevant on game day. These are things that if you had to develop them and code them would take far more resources and time than really uh, would justify for a use case that might only last for you know, a day or two. So I, I like to think about it in terms of where we start and stop in relation to the world of an app is, um, kind of thinking about things in the campaign sense. If, if I'm creating something that is, is for a shorter term marketing purpose, uh, does it make sense to put the developer on it, code it, get it in the app store? And, and that's really, really where it sits um, in terms of you know, how we, where we start and stop in the app, in the app world. Thanks for that, John. It, I mean, you have the story down really tight, so congratulations on that. Sometimes- uh, It's only taken six years, but uh, I'm still working <laughs> on it. No, no, thank you for that. And you know, speaking of, of the six years, John, which is, which is a great run, congratulations on that as well. If you think back to kind of the, the beginning and, and that, that first product, you know, that first client perhaps that, that pushed you to, to solve the problem that you're now doing a great job of solving, can you, can you talk to us a little bit about, about that journey? I mean, we're, we're speaking mostly today around product. Yeah. So you can center that around product and absolutely if there are other pieces to the story that round out the product story, you know, please let us know. We just want to, want to really yeah. understand that, that the story arc of Rover. 
Yeah, this can this can be a long one, but feel free to interject uh, with with cutoff or additional, you know, uh, keep me on the on the guardrails. But of course, um, yeah. So you know, maybe I'd start by giving a little bit of background about myself, and that you know, I worked uh, in the loyalty space, and you know, the world of loyalty, whether it's in you know, the Canadian market or, or globally, is is ultimately about how do we better understand the customer and deliver more relevant content, marketing, et cetera, based on, on data and incentivize, you know, purchases using points or, or other sort of discounts and things like that. And one of the things that we always faced in that industry was how do we engage the consumer um, in a retail context in store? So how do we sort of say, we know you're in the physical brick and mortar store. How do we uh, leverage the mobile app or, or the mobile ecosystem to understand that? and to change the, the user experience based on that. And, and, and really, that was a problem or an opportunity that you know, we were constantly looking at in loyalty. Um, what had happened around sort of 2013, 2014, Apple had come out with um, a new technology based on Bluetooth. Um, we probably, some of us may be familiar with this. Uh, it's now pretty ages, ages old, but they launched a technology called Beacons or iBeacons. And really what the promise of that tech was, um, was a technology that would allow devices and in turn mobile apps to understand where is a user and uh, have the app then do something in relation to that. Um, because Apple had got behind beacons, um, Android ado adopted some similar protocol, um, it was felt in the market that this, you know, this could be a really big thing, that um, you know, Apple got behind this tech, and you know, now marketers and brands and sports industry were gonna be able to be more contextual um, with, with their mobile experiences because they would know that a fan was in, the, in this section or that you know, a consumer was in aisle 13. What, what we saw as a problem, you know, you often when you think about product, you, you, you kind of look at a problem or an opportunity. The problem that we saw was that you know, the concept and the underlying technology seemed powerful, but for a marketer or a brand to take advantage of these beacons, it was going to be tremendously uh, labor intensive, resource intensive uh, to, you know, be able to adapt these apps based on where a user was. You know, if you think about a retail in a landscape of, you know, 500, 1,000 stores across a, a large geography, how am I going to manage campaigns and the, the, these mobile experiences based on where a consumer is? It would have been... Um, it would have required a tremendous amount of dev effort. So our MVP, our, our initial product, um, was a, a marketer solution for beacons. So that was basically uh, predicated on this, this understanding that you know, beacons are the underlying technology, but they're only as good as the user experience that, they, that is enabled. Um, so what Rover's MVP was, was the ability to create a mobile experience in a browser application. So in a web-based CMS, I could go in and I could say, okay, well, this is my um, in-store campaign. So here I've got my promotions and I'm gonna build this, this marketing campaign uh, in Rover. And then I'm gonna tie that to the, the underlying under the hood aspect of Rover, which was the sort of the context to say, okay, I'm gonna, I, I detect that this, this consumer is in store and now I'm gonna deliver this campaign. So from the outset, it was really um, about empowering the marketer, empowering the brand and, the, and then the digital folks to adapt the user experience of their mobile applications without again, having to have this dependency on, on developers. And I would say that theme, as we sort of fast forward to the rest of Rover beyond that initial inception, that theme um, was really uh, about you know empowering the content folks, the marketing folks, and not having this developer dependency, which has kind of blossomed into uh, a movement that we're seeing right now, which is kind of like the no code movement. This, this idea that you know there's there's if there's a dependency on on a heavy dependency on on developer resources for everything a marketer might want to do, it becomes prohibitive in terms of what you can do. So. That is sort of the origins of it. And I, I'm happy to kind of walk through how we went from this Beacon, Beacon CMS in 2014 to something vastly different. But well, I'll pause a, there and kind yeah. of say that's where it began. No, yeah. that's, no, no we'll, we'll, I think we'll get to that, yeah. uh, like the rest of the story through, yeah. through the other questions. Thanks for that. It's amazing that, that you bring up Beacons. I was doing a little bit of research in advance of our chat today, and, and I saw some great video of you going back to, I think it was about 2014 on... Uh, 
on, on one of the business tech uh, shows. Uh, it, was, it was great to see your, uh, so con- congratulations on being able to pivot you know, successfully. I think that that's, uh, that's not easy to do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the, the breadth of clients that you have. I think just before I do that, I wanted to remind everybody that um, you know, we'll get to uh, your questions as you have them. You can ask them directly in, in the chat. We are, we are watching that. So if you have some questions for John, please, uh, please feel free to, uh, to put them in there. Um, now, before we get there, I wanted to touch a little bit about you know, the diversity of your clients. So obviously, I, I know you through your sporting clients, but clearly you have clients in, in other businesses. It seems like retail yep. is a place where you've been able to, uh, to find success as well. Congratulations. And, and I think when you, when you look at retail, different than sports, and, and if we could pause on sports for a minute, because I've been in the sports area for a while now, and, um, and I do know that specifically in the sports team world, you know, if you can land a couple marquee or influential sports teams, then I'm not saying it's easy to land a lot more, but it isn't that hard. There is a lot of keeping up with the Joneses that teams look for, and there also um, is that fraternity amongst teams uh, especially people we know in digital and marketing and content who look to each other for inspiration and motivation. Because while the teams might compete on the field, the kind of the, the marketing teams and digital teams, they're ultimately competing against all the other forms of entertainment that are in or around their market. So if you think about the process for your sales in, in your retail or potentially of CPG customers, can you talk to us a little bit about how, how that works and, and what that integration looks like with those kinds of brands, maybe different than it does with a sports organization where there is more standardization around uh, the potential um, app agencies yep. that work with sports teams? Yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a really good question and it, it, it opens up a number of sort of lines of response. Obviously there's like the go-to-market strategy for that. There's the product aspect to that. But, um, you know, I think one of the things we look for when we look at the product and the problem it solves is there has to be an underlying appetite for some degree of frequency of bespoke content. So you think marketing, you think sponsorship in sports, um, you think um, various engagements. So if the app is something that's kind of more static um, and fixed in nature, that's not really a, a, a great, you know, Rover can't bring as much value there. When we look at markets where we can bring value, it, it's really a case of sort of the opposite of that, which is, you know, I, I'm an app publisher or I'm a brand and I have different marketing initiatives. I have perhaps brands that I need to incorporate in some of my creative for, you know, monetization. Um, and when I have that, you know, that appetite or that um, interest in, in a frequency of content, that's where we really come into mix. And and what ends up happening is, you know, when you look at the sports market, um, most, almost all professional sports teams, you know, across the world, vast majority of them, if not almost all of them, rely on an external product team for the most part to build their product, to build their apps. Um, so for them, the value proposition is um, we have content that we want to change up and we want to create, and we don't have developers in-house to even execute on that. We'd have this dependency. Um, in the case of other verticals uh, that we work in, like streaming, retail, um, you have a situation where they do have very large product teams in, in many cases. They have these resources, and it's less of a case of can they do it. Uh, and more of a case of, you know, we, you know, big enterprise company, they may have, you know, a development team of 50 or 100 folks, but um, they have a laundry list of priorities. And, and, and from a product perspective, the value proposition we often talk about is if I'm talking to a product owner, or product manager, you know, you, you, you know, all of us know that pain point of, you know, I have a list, uh, a roadmap that's a mile long. I have sales and marketing asking things for me. We have this core features we need to build. We're behind here. We got our release coming up. Um, so the value proposition to those enterprise product folks is um, you've got a long roadmap. You've got a lot of things you need to, to build and execute on. Why don't we look at that roadmap and say, hey, does it really make sense to build all 10 of those things? Or can maybe two or three of those things be satisfied using Rover, meaning, you know, maybe, you know, these core features are really important to us. We want to build and own them. But for this, you know, Black Friday marketing promotion 
or this one-off thing we're doing with a brand, do we really want to invest, you know, our developer resources um, into that, knowing that it might only last for a week or so? And so the value prop is more of a focus on what is, is core to your IP, to your roadmap and, and your mobile strategy, and then sort of use Rover as this means to continue to do these things that sales and marketing are asking you to do, but without having to distract the product team from it. Understood. Understood. I, I think if you can maybe provide a little more color around um, kind of who the client is, yeah. maybe, maybe in that yeah. enterprise environment yeah. Um, yeah. versus the sports team. And, and I think sure. um, just also to call out that no, I've been watching, you know, what you guys have been doing for years. It's not, you're not, obviously we've known each other for a long time now as well. And, and, and I see that a lot of what you're doing is around, around ticketing, around game day, around engagement, all around that as well. And, um, and that generally maybe is driven by the business side of, of a sports team, maybe the partnership side of a sports team. When you're looking at an enterprise customer, like who's driving that? Who, cause it seems like marketing tech to me. And, yeah. and I, th I think in the enterprise from, from my experience there, there, there still isn't a clear cut owner of, there's, there's marketing, we get that, and there's IT, and we understand that. But this concept of product, yep. if you can help us kind of fit in your engagement with product people and where they sit in the organization, yep. and who you're actually selling to, if you can maybe help us yep. understand those different stakeholders and how they come together. Yeah, so you brought a, a, you know, you make a good point. In sports, what we do, and we can get into it more later, obviously there's hard ROI around sponsorship and ticketing and, and dollars there. Obviously ticketing and sponsorship uh, are not necessarily the case in other you know, enterprise environments. So uh, it's a different persona when we talk about buyer personas, we're selling to a different persona. Um, you know, from an example perspective, we are starting to do a lot more in streaming. So audio streaming, for example, like, you know, your tune-ins, uh, your, you know, your, your, radio streaming services. We work with a very large one, radio.com um, in the US. And we work with some video streaming OTT products like the Red, Red Bull TV. And when you think about those environments, um, from a use case perspective, um, you know, if you're streaming a thousand or many thousand radio stations, you've got a potential, you've got, you've got a destination for each one of those radio stations. If I'm building out my roadmap there, my core focus is probably to make sure the streaming is of best quality, no latency and, and, and issues there, um, you know, that I've got lots of stations, everything's working and stable. Do I really want to build a station page for like WKTZ and, you know, Tuscaloosa, right? Does it make sense to build that? And so they might look at us and say, well, if we want to create a destination page within this app for this radio station, we can use Rover to do that. Um, and if we have a thousand radio stations, that, that, that still becomes scalable because again, not leaning on the dev resources, I can allow that radio station to create a destination within the app. Um, I can incorporate branding if I'm working with a partner from a monetization perspective. So it gives them that flexibility uh, in a low resource way. And the buyer persona almost always is either sits on, on engineering or product often both, right? Engineering from sort of a technical evaluation perspective and product from a solving business needs perspective. So the, the conversation with product is less around like in sports, you know, engage your fans, sell tickets and activate for your partners. And it's more make, you know, make that user experience more um, applicable um, and, and have less things that you have to put on the roadmap to build and allow that product team to focus on, you know, core IP, really deep engineering problems that are specific to your business. Okay. Okay. So thanks for breaking that down for us. As you, as you look to align on that roadmap or at least work off that roadmap, and this, this feeds into a question that, that, that has been asked uh, to you. So I'll kind of bring them together. This concept of, uh, of testing and iteration and learning, can you tell us a little bit about, about how that works, uh, given that you, know, you are like a, a product or a software as a service and you, know, you have your own roadmap? And, um, and so if you could talk about how, how you learn you know, either directly or with your clients and, and if there is a difference between your sports clients and more of your enterprise clients, you know, uh, please, please clarify that as well. But we're really focused around the, this concept of the problem to be solved and how that, that learning um, 
by your client and by you um, influences what that product is, what that problem that you're, pro what is that problem that your product is solving? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it, 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 it starts a lot with, I'll bring it into the, the time we're in right now, the COVID, you know, era where there's a lot of uncertainty and, you know, you can look at that negatively or you can look at it through, you know, various optimistic and positive lenses. And one of the things we as a business have, you know, stressed in these times is to, you know, from a, from a relationship perspective, be supportive, be engaging and, and try to help clients. But another thing we're doing is we're taking a lot of time to have as many conversations with customers as possible with a break in the action in sports or in, in other verticals where people are at home and, and more willing to take calls let's invest as almost as much time as we can in talking to customers, um, understanding their business needs, understanding those problems. I think, you know, when, when you start a company, if you're looking at it from a founder perspective or even as a product owner, it, it, it in the busyness of everything, it's far too easy to become somewhat insular and, and focused internally on, on what you have to get done and what's on your plate. Um, but it's times like these that can allow us to really emphasize or have the conversations with customers to understand, like you mentioned, the problems they're facing um, and, and what they're trying to achieve. And so, you know, I can elaborate that in different ways, but I would say one of the things that, that has come from that is um, when, you, when you have a conversation that is, that is a little bit more open, a little bit more strategic about the business, um, you know, you can really understand how the product can be applied. Oftentimes, customers, I would say most customers underutilize any product they purchase, right? There's a lot more features and things that can be done that a product might have than a customer knows about. So oftentimes, yes, you can build things and, and that comes from understanding those problems and the needs of the customer. But you can also think about how does your product, how is it applied to business needs that you may not have known previously that have emerged because of a change in the landscape? Um, because, you know, you know your product almost so much that it's almost a burden because you think everyone else knows it so well too. But, you know, oftentimes there are things that you can sort of say, hey, that business problem or that, that objective you're trying to achieve you know, we could use in this case Rover to actually do A, B, C, D um, and help get there. So I, I glad I, you're, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you're talking about that being, um, be, being resourceful and, uh, and learning that there is not, you know, one solution for, for a problem. There are many solutions that I completely agree. And, and I, I've walked in those, those footsteps before around how you have to, you have to be more agile in your thinking. You can't be so rigid of this is the way the product is intended to be used. And in many cases, it's the users themselves who you have to be open with, yep. even, even though it might, um, you know, you have to swallow a little bit of pride because you didn't necessarily intend on using your platform in that way. And I want to continue on, on this line of questioning, but I want to pause for just a moment because there are some people who've joined us in progress here. So, so we're speaking with John Coombs, who's the, uh, co-founder and CEO of Rover, uh, which is a great mobile platform to help engage uh, the audience of a mobile app. And if you have any questions, please, uh, you can ask them directly in, in the chat. And uh, we do have a good amount of time left with John today and, uh, and we, will, we will get to them. So John, you know, just continuing on the theme of you know, what you're doing now with your clients. I know we're jumping around here perhaps to some of the other questions that I have, um, but as you, uh, I was thinking about what you're doing now. How how are some of your clients using um, using Rover? I mean, we were in, in ways that maybe you didn't imagine, or how much are they leaning on you for that creativity to help yep. help us understand that a little better? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll answer that in the context of our sports customer base because it's it's very very broad, both in a geographic and uh, you know you know use case kind of context. Um, you know, one of the things that hit kind of early. I mean, we've been, we Mark, we've been in this, this world for a little while and, and, you know, have always felt, you know, the movement of digital as it relates to sports and where that's going and how important that is. But I think, you know, like in any industry, you have leaders and laggards. And I think what's interesting is that the current reality has really meant that the digital conversation, the role of it, the importance of it has really um, been accelerated and been elevated to the sea level, right? So, you know, there's a number of calls we've had where you can, you know, you know that that call is that conversation is happening because the C, the CRO or the CEO, you know, called the digital team and was like, hey, 
we don't have uh, teams playing in, in our stadium, so it's on you. What are we doing, right? And so whether that, that team or that organization had fully adopted um, digital or to what extent and how important it was as an organizational priority, um, you know, that, that remains, that could have been, you know, variable. But now I think there's a, there's a big push and a big emphasis on that. Um, you know, and it's really just accelerating adoption, just as you're seeing with e-commerce and other uh, technologies or, or, or industries that are accelerated by what's going on today. Um, in terms of usage, um, you know, and being creative, uh, when you look at a sports team and, and their content, with no content in a contemporary sense, Obviously, you know, you have to look back, right? You have to look back at historical stuff. We see, you know, being here in Toronto, we see, you know, Blue Jays baseball games uh, in the great heyday of 92, 93 being re-aired. Um, and, you know, I think you're seeing that too from the digital content strategy of a lot of sports teams is to sort of look back at, look back at historical content and use it as an opportunity to tell stories, um, to uh, bring to life in new digital ways um, team history. So one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is, you know, um, teams using Rover to um, do historical based kind of trivia to engage fans or to, you know, play video of like top five goals by X player and then vote on them, that kind of thing. So looking back at the content they have and then using that as a means to engage in a contemporary way. And, and beyond that, I mean, even just sort of PSA use cases, um, when we work with um, a couple of Premier League teams and when, when that shut down, Rover became a main tool for the communication strategy around what was actually happening, um, what was happening both in terms of the, the team and the experience for fans, um, but also in terms of what they were doing in the community from a charitable perspective. Um, stuff that we hadn't seen before, um, charitable initiatives, uh, fundraising initiatives by players in their community um, using the product for that um, was something that, that definitely emerged uh, with with uh, COVID coming out. No, it's great that those teams had the had the foresight or those clients to to have Rover ahead of time so that if they wanted to engage that mobile audience, I mean, the tool was there. I'm very familiar with many mobile apps and not, not all of them have the capabilities that uh, that mm -hmm. Rover can provide for them. You know, thinking about the um, the actual people who are in your, and I don't know what you call it, so I'm going to call it your uh, administrative portal, okay. for lack of lack of a better term. You might have a sexy term. <laughs> what what is your term? Why don't we call it what it is? Well, I mean, you're just in the platform of the CMS. I don't have anything. Okay, in all right, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That that that's a new marketing strategy you can work mm. on. So thinking about that, your, uh, your CMS and the users of the CMS, I'm, I know that this is one of the great challenges of our time for marketing departments or game day staff, um, that you know, they're, they're, depending on the size of the team, I mean, we, we know that that department is generally still very small and they're likely managing things like social accounts, Rover, website content, I mean, any number of things. We, I'm sure we can, we can list them as long as our arm. So how, how do they, how have you evolved your platform yep. so that when, if I'm a, you know, a game day coordinator mm -hmm. and, and I know that I have to do these, whatever it is, hundred things in a day and that potentially they are that long. When I look at what I need to do in the app, I'm not overwhelmed by that task. Like I'm like, yeah. it's not that I'm looking forward to it. I don't want to paint a picture that is not reality, mm -hmm. but it's just like, yeah. I, yeah. I'm happy to use Rover. It's I'm I'm not any it's not any harder or easier than using Twitter as an example. So, kind of what 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 have you done to make your tool you know um, valuable yeah. to not just the team but also the staff so that um, that customer success element, which is so critical in a company like yours, um, is is a reason why um, you get renewals. Yeah. I'm glad you uh, you kind of concluded with that emphasis on on CS or customer success. Um, you know, I would say uh, certainly from my perspective and 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 throughout the organization at, at, at Rover, I mean, it runs in our DNA that customer success is a top priority. Um, you know, a product is a product, but if you don't have the the support or the skills or the understanding to get value out of it then the best products can fall flat. And, and you know, especially as you alluded to earlier in, a, in an industry, um, you know, sort of so closely knit like sports, 
a, a really bad customer experience can you know potentially ruin your business. And so I think having an emphasis on, on customer success um, throughout the organization, you know, from with sales, with ongoing support, with how you think about product is, is really crucial. Um, you know, and so what that means, how that, how does that translate tact tactically and, and in practice? Um, you know, uh, it, it's really about really starting from why are you using Rover? You know, why have you bought Rover as a product? Um, for some, it's heavily about sponsorship. For others, it's it's heavily about you know their metrics of mobile engagement and and, and some other things. But really, starting from what is the pro what is what is your organization see as a mobile priority or even a beyond mobile? What is it? What are some organizational priorities? How can we then think about our product so that we're applying it or or bringing you into the sort of the the product ecosystem in a way that's consistent with what you know, the organization is trying to achieve. Um, and I think, you know, beyond, beyond that, it, it's really going to your sort of in week usage uh, challenge of I've got a million things to do. How do I get these done? We look at a few things. We look at um, what can be automated. What are some automated, automated or automatic campaigns that can be set up pre-season that can essentially deploy based on a user action and require zero ongoing effort from a team? Those are really important. Um, we also look at, you know, we all talk about content calendaring, right? And so in the case of sports, you know, if you look at maybe the NFL, for example, you've got, you know, the draft coming up, the combine, some preseason, in season, um, you know, ticketing, you, you've got this sort of uh, chronological sort of series of events. Certainly, things will happen in in week in season on game day that will require some some high touch lift because that news or that content has just emerged but there are lots of use cases that we can look out over the course of the year and say you know what are we going to do uh, uh, you know for the combine or for the draft and we can really implement a lot of things in advance of the season when everybody's kind of running running around and, and, and things are really busy um, so that's another thing. And I think lastly, another thing that going back to what runs in our DNA and we mentioned CS as, as a big pillar of that. Um, another thing is just UX for our users. So when we think about product design and user experience for our customers, like you mentioned, they're logging into 10, 17, 30 different things in a day. If, if, if it's not intuitive product design and the user experience for that sports team or that digital marketer is confusing or complicated, that's a big, uh, that'll have a big impact on the frequency with which, or even the willingness for your customers to log in and use the product. So having a very UX centric mindset to the design of the product and who's using it, it's probably the third uh, thing that I would, I would touch on to answer that, that question. Yeah, thanks for that. No, it's really great to hear how disciplined you are in, in your thinking, it, uh, the way you speak about your product, the, what I see at the your product do uh, for for the apps that I that I have that use it. I mean, it uh, congratulations on on what you've been able to accomplish with that you know a disciplined forward thinking approach to uh, CS among other things. We we do have some great questions that uh, that have been asked. Um, they're more they're more forward looking, so I'm going to save them for a few minutes uh, because they do kind of step away from Rover in particular. But while yeah. we're still on Rover, and and you brought something up that is uh, more of a passion of mine these days, uh, which, which is uh, user experience. And maybe, you, maybe if you can shed some light on the, for the product marketers and managers, maybe product designers who have joined us today uh, for Product AMA, if you could talk a little bit about your process for user experience and design, um, and if there's yep. any in particular methodologies or tools or uh, yep. design thinking exercises that maybe you, you guys have figured out or really work for you, just some, some words of wisdom that uh, for yeah. others to, to look to. So I am, I think, you know, as every, every sort of CEO of a company has a different sort of key focus or skill set that they bring to the table that really drives the organization. And one of the things I, I like to talk to, to people about both internally and externally is that I am by no means a designer, you know, at all. My, my design work would be, a, you know, grade three level at best. But what is important for me is to acknowledge that that gap in deficiency, 
to hire appropriately and to recognize that that's really important. So just because it's not your skill set or something that you're super comfortable with or, or do yourself, you know, it's really important to recognize the value of it and nurture that within the organization. So, um, you know, we, we hire with, with, with these key core values in mind, hire best in class CS, set a high bar, hire really strong UX designers, um, because we know that's important and it's really important to us. So, you know, that's definitely one thing. I, I think another thing is, is, I think you have to use your product a lot. I mean, in the, especially in the earlier years, um, we had a demo app and everyone in the company, um, you know, we allotted time to, to make sure we were using the product. People who weren't designers, people who might not even be using our product, but like what was, what was frustrating? How easy were you able to create this campaign? What would you have liked to see? Um, and, and really, it has multiple benefits. Obviously you're going to get UX feedback internally. And when you're starting out, you don't have enough customers to have anything statistically significant, right? Different customers are going to pull you in a million directions. Um, but if you, you know, have that where you're using the product a lot, you're going to, you know, not only understand pain points and UX improvements, but you'll also come to really understand, uh, you know, the product and, and what it does. It's, it's amazing to me how often, you know, you talk to salespeople or, or, you know, folks in organizations and it, it makes sense as an organization scales, but that don't really have a, a full grasp on how the product works or, you know, it's, it's, it's features beyond like a key bullet or a key message. So using the product, I think is another thing that it's a discipline that I think is important to get into. Obviously it depends what your product is, but for us, that's one that stands out. Well, thanks for that. I, mean, I think that, um, as you, as you apply that discipline to your business, uh, one of the other questions that came through was asking about the tools, the specific, um, whether that's, uh, you know, Jira or Basecamp, mm -hmm. or of course, I mean, there's GitHub behind all of this, but any of those tools that, that you can share with, uh, with the audience that, that you guys have come to love. Yeah. On the product side, I mean, I won't speak too much on it, but other than to say, I mean, yeah, we use a ticketing Zendesk ticketing based system for customer and, you know, feedback to, to get put in prioritize. Um, we do, uh, we have a series of product meetings that we do. So there is kind of the, like in the, in the sort of the micro one, which is like a week on week, little bugs, what's popping up, um, what product stakeholders are, are involved in that. And that's happening with frequency. There's a, there's another one that happens kind of every two or three weeks. That's a little bit more macro than that. I myself join a monthly uh, product meeting, which is a little bit more roadmap planning and, and sort of uh, looking at what are so where you know the, the the combination of the vision and the and the direction of the business and what we're hearing in the market and looking at you know what do the next four months look like you know eight months look like um, in terms of what we want to build and why and and you know you want to find that balance between what's being requested of you by your customers what is consistent with your ultimate end goal, um, which customers might not have full visibility to because you're still working it out and finding that balance. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. And then maybe you can round out the, the, the discussion around your, your product before we get into more of the forward looking um, items around just around data and around, I mean, I, I understand how your product fits into um, the, the app of, of your client, but I think a couple of things in particular, which uh, I would talk about, um, you know, first party data and, and how, if you're capturing that, if, if the container app is capturing that, or is it getting passed to you, then that engagement data, like, are mm -hmm. you able to get that visibility into who that person is? And, and if you're not as Rover, you know, are your clients asking for that data so they can feed that back into their own uh, data lake or CRM? Yep. Lots there to unpack, um, you know, c c drawing a sort of a bridge to the previous conversation around CS, I think, um, you know, CS and, and, and customer value is only as good as your ability to tell the ROI story to your customers and for, for them to be able to see it. Right. So when we talk about CS, that's not just training and answering phone calls. It's also demonstrating the lift. Um, how is the product driving quantitative results based on the strategic objectives we set at the outset. Um, so really crucial that 
you know, when we think about product and we're moving product forward that we're also measuring and, and allowing our customers to see the value it's bringing. I think that's, that's certainly, um, you know, a, re a really important piece. We look at the data that exists in the app ecosystem in which we play. There's kind of three buckets. Um, there is data that's first party to Rover. So for example, you know, without getting too much into the product, if I deliver a campaign to you through, uh, you know, my club app, um, and you open that campaign and you click through Rover is going to have first part of party visibility to you got the campaign, you opened it, you clicked through that gives us some sort of engagement metrics, right? Um, further to that, the app itself has, uh, data points that can be passed to Rover and can inform a smarter segmentation strategy. So for example, um, you know, in, in the case of uh, sports, you're talking about like player preference or, um, I want to subscribe to score updates, things like that. There are things that as a user of an app, I can indicate what is my interest and that can be passed to Rover and inform segmentation. And then the third piece is third party uh, external to the app, uh, CRMs and data sources. So, you know, there's a lot of those, but one that we're all probably pretty familiar with is on the ticketing side. So, um, you know, you, you've heard about it. We've talked about it. We've got an integration with, uh, Ticket, Ticketmaster, who obviously serves mo vast majority of our customers in terms of ticketing. And ticketing is a very powerful data point in the world of sports because, you know, in, in, in short, it tells me as a digital person at a sports team, is this person a season ticket holder? Are they my high value, you know, member? Um, do, you know, or do they have a ticket to this game or not? And those two data points can be extremely valuable in terms of a communication strategy. You know, we think about there's there's multiple ways to engage in sports, as we know. Are you going to the game or are you not? Your experience and what's relevant to you is very different um, based on on that data point. So uh, we've done a number of integrations with third party um, sources of data that 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 are relevant to a uh, sports team. OK, and it's, it's good to know that you're you know, you're part of an ecosystem. You're you're a partner, uh, not just to your clients, but to others. So thanks for rounding that out. I mean, I think before we time out, we want, want to get to some more visionary topics um, that um, the members of the audience have asked. So we'll look at it in, in a couple of ways. So if you think about you know, where we are, maybe not today, it's tough to say today, but where, where we were and where you thought you were going, you know, talk, to, talk to us about kind of the future of, of fan engagement, how that's tied to revenue, whether it's, whether it's uh, within the client base that you have, it, it, it doesn't need to be, right? We're yeah. thinking about, you, I know that you're you know, actively looking at the market yeah. as any good CEO should be, seeing what's out there, not just competitors, but emerging technology. Paint a little bit of a picture for us of what that you know, fan experience looks like um, in the not too distant future and how that ties back into to revenue. And when I say revenue, I don't just mean uh, partnership revenue. I'm also thinking about direct to consumer revenue. Yeah. So like all these great questions, you could go on. This is a topic, you know, the future of sports and monetization, where it's going. Oh man, we could talk about this for one forever, but I'll, I'll sort of condense it down to two, two things. Um, I think the first, which is kind of more, you know, a little bit more sort of five year time horizon, more, more um, something that we can really see happening is the globalization trend of sports. So, um, you know, I think it's very clear that no longer is like a city's team, you know, relegated to just the, the walls of the arena and that audience. Right. And, and it's, if you look at, you know, how many fans can be in a basketball arena, and then you look at how many fans might love a team that are based in China, it's by a massive magnitude, a lot more outside of that arena. Right. There's a lot of fans there. And I think if you look, you know, we're working in both, the UK and in North America, oftentimes, you know, it's said that North America is ahead of other markets in terms of digital. But uh, one of the things I think that we can learn from Europe is the sort of globalization of sports and big Premier League teams, how they've sort of gone far beyond the walls of their domestic market to become massive global businesses. Um, and I think you're starting to see that happen in, in, in North America. And I think that's a theme that's going to happen. And it requires uh, a lot of digital things uh, in order to facilitate that global global expansion of the audience. Um, we go from looking at the monetary model of the fan to be less about ticketing, food and beverage, and sort of in venue things, and more into um, you know perhaps 
micro micro dollar transactions like you know club exclusive content uh e-commerce related things um and looking almost like uh that looking at that fan globally through the sort of lifetime value uh kind of lens and and when i've got a you know 200 million fans outside of my market and you know maybe 5 million fans domestic in, in my market, there's a big growth opportunity. And I think you'll see that um, in terms of, you know, sport and where it's going, you know, obviously there's, there's a lot happening and a lot changing. I think one of the things that is interesting is the, uh, we might be going into an, an era of, you know, we're starting to see that with, with esports, but an era of kind of new sports and different approaches. So, you know, I've, I've got a, uh, a guy I know um, who runs a drone racing league. Um, you know, this is something that is really fascinating to me. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's, 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 you know, fast paced. It's, uh, it's got people involved, but it's also bringing in technology. Um, and, and I think, you know, as we see esports, things like drone racing and a whole other emergent set of sports, there's a lot of promise for those, uh, those places as, you know, perhaps there's a decline in people watching golf and baseball. Yeah, no, thank you for that and, and the perspective. I think that um, one thing that, that I've noticed, um, having, um, having been teaching for the last number of years with an, a very international class, there, um, there are a certain number of students who, who are from China, and, and we talk about WeChat a lot. And when we compare kind of the app ecosystem, and I'll just focus on China because that, that, that's the example that, that I'll go with here versus maybe other, other Asian, uh, Asian mm-hmm. countries. But within a, an ecosystem like that, it's, uh, it's one app. It's one app, and then there are services that are provided to it. Uh, user experience is, is more utilitarian. It's not as immersive as you know, what we like to think of over here in North America. Now, is that an area that, that you've been looking at, providing kind of your engagement services into an, an ecosystem like that, where you're, you're deploying an app to a larger marketplace, you're not deploying an app or providing a library of code that, that is specific yeah. to you know one app builder, um, but it's a it's an integration that you can you know turn on for any number of customers, literally thousands of customers. Is that mm-hmm. is that something you've, you spent any time on? Not yet. I think when we look at our global market, you know, uh, some some key areas for us are you know our Europe and um, you know. Australia as well. Those are probably markets where we're seeing the market is, is, is aligned with what we're doing. Um, absolutely. There's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of eyes on what's going on in China. It's just, it's not a right now thing for us. Um, obviously, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's some hurdles around uh, the way their internet is set up and structured and, and essentially firewall that it's difficult to deploy a product uh, from North America into that market. Okay. So, any uh, any closing closing thoughts or messages that you have uh, you have for the audience? You you've been asked a lot of questions, and now now the floor is is yours. Sure. Um, I mean, listen, I I certainly enjoyed enjoyed this chat, and um, you know, it, this is a topic that obviously I'm very passionate about, so, uh, as are you, and I love talking about something we can all get excited about, which is sport. And then also tying it into sort of a, a product mindset. I think that's a really fascinating subject and, um, you know, happy to, to do this, this again or, you know, connect with anybody offline if, if folks have additional questions. Um, you know, n- nothing more. Uh, if I start another topic, I'm going to run over time. So. <laughs> so what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, certainly, certainly LinkedIn uh, is, is a good way. Uh, I spend, spend a good amount of time there. Um, so do that. That's a good way. Okay. Well, so thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Follow Product MA on Twitter and send us your topic suggestions. We look forward to seeing you soon.